Hey, everybody. I'm Josh Schachter, founder and CEO of Update AI and host of Unchurned. Joining me today is Edward Chu, the co-founder and CEO of Catalyst. Catalyst is one of the customer success platforms that is taking the CS world by storm. They were incorporated in 2017, really got going in 2020, and have grown from 36 to 91 employees in just the last two years. They are building out a vibrant community of customer success in New York City, where they're headquartered, along with other parts of the world. They just announced uh, the next class of their of their mentorship coaching program. They just raised their B Series B round, or just announced it at least, and have some really cool uh, content around that. And I go on and on. Edwards um, been, you know, has become a, a true beacon of customer success leadership in the world today. So, Edward, thank you so much for being on the show. Josh, thank you. And I've never been described as a, a beacon, but uh, I'll <laughs> take it. That's, that's that's a nice word. Yeah, I don't know. It's the word that came to me. It's a little odd, but it's the word that came to me at the moment. So nice. we'll roll with it. You know, it's, it's fresh. A, it's like a nice it. shiny object. Yeah, cool. Yeah. All right. So so we're called on share and we want to go raw here. We want to get to know you and then we'll get into to some of the questions about Catalyst, about customer success, about SaaS. Um, so just to warm up things here for a bit, where were you born and where do you live now? Uh, I was born in Taipei, Taiwan. Uh, I moved to the U.S. Uh, not really speaking a word of English, and my parents moved me to Palm Springs. And truthfully, that was like the roughest place you could move any Asian family to. I think I was the only Asian person in town, and uh, getting made fun of every day as a third grader uh, instantly removed all accent and improved my English speaking capabilities. Uh, you know, kids are cruel, especially at a young age. Um, and now I am in New York City. I, I spent COVID uh, in Palm Springs. Uh, uh, and uh, I can imagine it was a, a new world coming from Taipei. And so you were about eight years old then, I guess, the third grade? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, it's, been, it's been a long time. So I, I'm not good with age, age groups. But yeah, it was, it was around eight, eight, eight years old. Do you think having come from from Taiwan over to the U.S. has impacted the way you think about entrepreneurship and, and the journey of how you got to, to launching the company? Uh, absolutely, because Taiwan is not really uh, known for entrepreneurship. Most of the folks there, they come back uh, and they just work at big companies, big hardware manufacturing companies. Uh, and that's the biggest thing in Taipei is that most people, they go to school, they study from... 9 a.m. to midnight, and then they um, go to go to work for a big company. I mean, as you see, everything, probably your hat is made in, in Taipei, Taiwan, and, and uh, that's that's where people go. Made in Vietnam, but that's okay. That's uh, the competitive, the competitive <laughs> close, industry. Close, over there. Yeah. region. Same, yeah, same region, yeah. Yeah, yeah. Uh, what's something that, that people might not expect to hear about you? Um... I think what's the biggest thing, I mean, I've, I've shared this on a few few other podcasts, but I think we may have different audiences here. But when I was in Taipei, Taiwan, um, I was supposed to be in commercials and, and, and movies. My parents submitted me to this game show. It's a very popular game show. And I ended up winning the game show. And uh, um, they asked me to do commercials and, and shows and stuff. And my mom said to them, Nah, he's he's moving to the U.S. and he's going to go learn English and uh, do that life instead. So part of me blames her because I, I could have been, you know, a, a celebrity and, and, and traveling the world doing shows probably comes with its own set of challenges. But uh, that's something that's something in, in my in my past life. To be fair, I'm a terrible singer, so I'm not sure they, they would have had to do a lot of a lot of voiceovers if, if I were to sing songs. Was this like a like a kids say the darndest things type of game? I mean, you were like five, six, or seven, right? Like, what what was the nature of the show? Yeah. There is a show every Sunday that's called Looking Like a Superstar. So they submitted my photo of a celebrity that I look like. I guess out of thousands of applications, they thought I really looked like him. So you go into the show, and then you and ten other contestants. You sing or act out whatever special skills and talent the celebrity has. And mine in particular was a very popular pop artist and singer. And I sang his song and I ended up winning first place. And um, yeah, it was a 
pretty, pretty interesting time of my life. That's cool. I, I so went you... to like a karaoke bar every single day for like a month, just learning his songs. It was like boot camp training. Uh, uh, that was no fun for, for a kid my age. What and was his name? Pressure. It was millions and millions of people watching. Aaron Kwok. And, and what was his English name? What's the song? Oh man, I can't even tell you the name anymore. It's been it's been so long, and, and my team always brings up this video, and they want me to sing it, and that's just there's just no chance. I'm trying to get away from that as, as much as possible. I'm, I'm typically a pretty shy and, and secluded person, so that 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 was a time period that I'm I'm trying to forget. Okay, I was going to try to pull you in there. The next question was going to be, how does it go again? But uh, okay, we'll, yeah, we'll, yeah, we'll, yeah, we'll no, go down no, that path. Not out. Yeah. Not happening. <laughs> okay. All right. So you guys just raised uh, around, and I say just, but but uh, how many months ago was this? When did you raise your Series B? Yeah, it was a couple months ago, but we just um, announced recently, as as you saw last week. And yeah, it's really great for the business. We're excited, and that every single company right now is so deeply focused on retention, mainly because you know sales is slowing down for a bunch of businesses. Markets are tanking. 700 points a day, it seems like, which is terrible for most of us that, you know, do trading on, on Robin hoods and our, et cetera. But for us, like, luckily for us, that is the business that we're in. We help companies to your point, upsell and retain customers with precision. And right now that's top of mind for every CEO, every C-level exec, to be honest. And, and we're, we're, we're excited by it. And the investor community was obviously excited, excited about it. You saw from the article, we had customers invest. We had thought leaders in the community invest. So um, it was a it was a party room. Everyone was was involved, and it was great to have that level of support from the community. Yeah, yeah, and and so you, you've been very transparent with information. You, you've at this point, you've it was a twenty million dollar round, right? So you've raised over sixty five million yeah. to date. You doubled your evaluation right. from the previous round to two hundred and forty six million. Um, yep. And and like you said, it's a party round. Which for for those that that may not know that. You know, generally, that, that's just folks are coming together. There's not necessarily a lead investor, um, but but you've got lots of different stakeholders. Was there a lead investor? In no, we, ha we, we had a lead, lead investor, um, Stepstone. They are actually an LP of a bunch of our existing investors. So they knew our business really well already as, as an LP, given that they get updates from our investors. And um, they wanted to, to come in on a round during a time where um, we didn't really need the money. But I think for us, like, to have an opportunity to have all these different people invest in our business um, is a good show and signal to the community that we just have tremendous levels of excitement from um, folks in the CS industry. Did they come to you and convince you to open up a new round or was it more of the type of thing that was already in the back of your mind? It was, it was always in a, I mean, as a CEO, you're, you're always fundraising, right? Like at the, especially in the down market, like you, you always want to be prepared and, and be, be flush with cash, even if you don't need it. And I think um, we've been engaging and having conversations. So it wasn't like they had to convince us. I think there was a lot of mutual love between the two groups. Um, we wanted an opportunity to bring in. We've had a bunch of customers ask if they can invest. We've had thought leaders ping me all the time on LinkedIn saying they would love to invest. So it just came together pretty organically. And it was such a great opportunity because everyone I reached out to, they were, couldn't be more excited to, to participate. And, and um, we are very fortunate to have that opportunity, especially when funding is hard right now. You know, there, you hear from a lot of CEOs that they're getting term sheets pulled, valuations have drastically changed. And, and um, we're very blessed that, that it worked out for us. Well, what I love about the round is that you, you not only continue to have preeminent investor institutional money coming to, to Catalyst, um, I mean, to have Excel, um, you know, as a major shareholder is absolutely incredible. And then the other investors as well, other institutions as well. But you've also have individuals who can really add value, who are true leaders in go to market and commercialization for SaaS. Uh, so I can only imagine that's that's very strategic and very helpful for you, uh, you know, as you approach and grow your market. Yeah. I mean, we have CS leaders from, from Miro, Slack and, and other major companies who have been in the industry for a long time. They see the existing tooling space on the market and, um, you know, they saw Catalyst and, and 
they've they've heard incredible things throughout the community. As you mentioned, we invest heavily into the customer success community. So um, I think by by now, uh, most people have either heard of Catalyst or 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 in some some of our community programs. Coaching Corner is a big one, and and um, I think. People want to not only invest in the best platform on the market, they want to invest in something that they feel like is going to uplift the community and create more opportunities for the community and evangelize for the community. And and I think that's something that most people believe Catalyst is, is doing a very good job of right now. So kudos to to our marketing team for for creating that ecosystem. In your deck that you shared through the Business Insider article, there's a slide that I want to take us to. It's a little hard to read. It's um, it's a, a fine line <laughs> graph. Do you know the, the chart that I'm talking about here? You know where I'm going? I do, I do, I do. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Let's see if you can let's see if you can guess because we haven't discussed this before. What's the slide uh, that I'm referring to? The multiple users and multiple adoption across compared to other platforms and the types of stakeholders using Catalyst. That, I Nailed think it. that was the graph yeah. that. All right. <laughs> that That's the one that landed 20 million? Yeah, that's exactly it. So I'm, I'm glad out of all the slides you picked that one because that was, that, was, that was the golden slide. You kind of tuck it in the back always. That's the money slide right there. All right. So unlike – I'm reading from, from the deck that went straight to the, the boardroom table, the VCs, right? Unlike yeah. our competitors, Catalyst users log in almost every single day and sometimes on the weekend. There's three operative parts of that H1. Unlike our competitors, right? I love that little dig yeah. right there. Yeah. Um, logging in almost every single day and on the weekends. So it's break this. I'm sure you've got this imprinted in the back of your mind. You can visualize the slide I'm talking about. Break br yeah. break it down for us. We are a CS platform uh, in the community that is built by a CS leader. Um, that is the unique differentiator of Catalyst. Like. I previously built and led a customer success organization. So when you log into Catalyst, it looks and feels like it's built by somebody who deeply understands your pain points. And I think the biggest thing is this wasn't some idea that I came up with over the weekend and decided, hey, let's do customer success. I lived and breathed customer success. I did all the quarterly business reviews. I've woken up at 3 a.m. to deal with customer complaints and beg product to build features for us. So I think the biggest thing is this is a real tool that is built by some folks and a team that understands CS very well. So when that's the case and we have such focus on how do we make a CSM's job and lives and workflow easier, that's why we see such high levels of adoption. That is why it's the first thing that you look at when you wake up in, in the day and the last thing you do before you log out of your day as a CS professional. Um, we also make it very easy for you to customize. I think that's the fundamental thing is Catalyst is easy to deploy, easy to build, easy to configure. And you know this better than anyone, especially you, you have your own software companies. Intuitive user experience matters these days. Gone are the days where people want legacy tools that take six months to a year to deploy a lot of admins to build things out. And that's just not our use case. And everyone can have a view that they love. Everyone can wake up to the view that they configured for themselves. And when you have a tool that works the way that you want it to, you are obviously excited to log in. And that's always been our, our foundation. Okay, so I, I heard in your response there, fluff, 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 PR agency uh, jargon about <laughs> about built by a CS leader, um, you know, just just wipe wipe some dust off my yeah. shoulders. But then you got into it that uh, you know easier to 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 deploy and to configure. Maybe you said build as well. Um, so talk more about that. Like, how are you guys easier to deploy, configure? Does that mean you have a better onboarding process? And, and then what I actually am really interested in, in knowing is how did you determine that that was going to be your angle into a space that already had incumbents? You already had gains, so you've already had client success and others. Um, yeah. Where'd you, where'd you get that from? Well, I think the part of the story that's super important is I evaluated all these tools when I was a CS leader. And my peer groups around me, other VPs and other directors told me, Edward, don't buy the tool that I'm using. It cost me $100,000 a year or more. What was the Nobody tool, Edward? My... What was the tool? I can, you can't say it, but I can ask it. 
you, I mean, you know, there's tools like Gainside, to Tangle, all, all the all the players that that you've mentioned, and and look, they've been around for a long time. We have the utmost respect for the community that they've built, but. At the end of the day, that was the feedback that I was given. And I wasn't about to ask my CEO for a hundred grand uh, and require six months to deploy, especially when timing is everything, you know? I can't have two quarters go back with all productivity. So we built our own tool. My team and I built our own tool and that was the foundation. So we got a chance to see what's under the hood. We got a chance to see what does it mean to connect your data stack to Salesforce and an internal tool or, or a data lake. What does it mean to extract all those complicated data into a singular view so that you can look across the board? So because we basically built the Legos ourselves, we knew what it was like to create a better experience for the end user. So to your point, onboarding on legacy platforms takes six months to a year. We get our average deployment is somewhere between 30 to 45 days with some deployments in two week period. That is unheard of. Our connectors to data lakes like Snowflake, uh, Redshift, BigQuery is such a great integration. You immediately see the data that you did not have access to before that you would have to beg engineering for. It's a one-click integration. So I think for us, like those were a lot of the core focuses where I saw the existing tools in the market. And I said, look, the feedback is it's hard to get data, hard to ingest the data, hard to visualize the data. At the end of the day, CS is no longer just relationship building. It's all about how do you operate based on the data sets of your customers, the trend of your customers. So that's why we invested so much on the data piece. And truthfully, like that's where we really shine. You talked about growing up in Taiwan and the traditional culture of education, going to school from 9 a.m. To, to midnight or studying through midnight. So how do you jump from Catalyst back to Taiwan? This is a, a, a great Great segue, and you're keeping me on my toes. I'm like trying to have to context switch, and you're bringing back to my childhood days, now to my operating days as CEO. But but let's let's keep it going. I like it. I've never done one like this, so let's. I've just been watching I'm, a lot of looking, a lot of you know a lot of MSNBC hardball, right? So yeah, uh, yeah. So but I, I I have a point to make here, and it's a compliment. It, it, I'm going to make an assumption. That I, I worked in Southeast Asia, by the way. I built a startup out there a few years ago, and, and I know that there's a really industrious, hardworking culture. And that's that's the point I'm trying to make, is that long hours at school, uh, long hours, even if it is kind of the corporate person that's wor that's working out there, you said a little bit less entrepreneurial, it's it's hard, industrious work. And I know that, that you took that mentality and that attitude towards your first days at Catalyst. Um, and now I've lost my point getting into this whole this whole banter with you here. <laughs> uh, but oh, that's right. So how did you? So so long nights and days, and, and you've described to me before, like playing video games with your co-founders, with your brother up late, and all that kind of stuff. Just like really kind of living, sleeping out of the office type of thing. Um, I don't know if there were ramen noodles involved, maybe. But but how did you know when you first had something? And and, and embedded within that, like tell us about your first real customer that you brought on board. Yeah. Um... We reached out to a bunch of people that we knew in the community that love customer success. And there were smaller companies. You're not going to come out with a brand new tool and, and you're building it in, in, a, in a garage. For our case, it was like a four-person WeWork room and then convince large enterprises to, to take that risk on you. So you obviously, you're going to friends and family, people in, in the CS space willing to take the chance. And... Um, we knew we had something when honestly a handful of our existing our, our customers said hey this is not as full featured as what we see on the tool and for us we're like no shit we have one engineer and three of us in, in a room that aren't building anything so great of course we don't have any as many features yet but the point is they said my team actually is logging in and using this tool and I now have visibility. I now have alignment. And more importantly, now everybody on my team is doing the same thing. Consistency matters in customer success because if you have one CSM taking note and, and Evernote, and another CSM taking note and Apple notes and another CSM taking meeting notes in a notebook, when the CEO says, you know, give me all the trended data report of all the past quarterly business reviews over the past quarter, how are you going to aggregate all that data? How are you going to know what do customers want? What do customers hate about your platform? What do customers want to see improve? So um, 
we just had a very, very tight hold early on on the actual workflows of a CSM. And that's what we wanted to nail, which is the best tool and the best user experience for the actual people that do the hard work, which at the end of the day are the CSMs. Did you charge for that first product to the first customer? Uh, we did, but not much. Um, it was like a couple thousand dollars, five thousand dollars for unlimited seats. And, and you know, that's that's kind of what you have to do. You, you take what you can get. But as time goes on, you, you feel more confidence and you increase pricing. And um, we also, you know, didn't really know this was my first company. It's not like I had previous contacts and setting pricing for a B2B SaaS company. So you kind of learning on the fly. And I think that's the fun part about building a startup is, you know, you're kind of charging what you want. And that's, that's, that's an experience that many people don't get to say. By the time you join a company, pricing is already set. Here we were, we're just making up pricing uh, as, as we go. Yeah. $5,000. I'll take it. <laughs> All right. How about this for segues? Let's talk about COVID. <laughs> So Let's do it. Nice. It's, it, it, it's been documented. You've talked about this. You've shared this story before. It's an intimate one. And I, I, I yeah. you know, you're, 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 you're um, very open, um, which I really respect in, in your leadership. Uh, your brother, Kevin, co-founder of Catalyst, chief operating officer of Catalyst with you from the beginning, <laughs> beyond just the, the business, um, yeah. had COVID. And he has mild asthma and yep. he had COVID really bad. For patient those that zero, haven't... Patient number one, basically. Patient this number one. So, February in 2020. Doesn't get oh, wow. any earlier than that. I yeah. didn't realize that. And that was in New York City, right? That was in crazy New York City. Crazy New York City. So for those that haven't heard the story yet, give us a little context. And because and, there is something I want people to understand about actually about you that comes out of this story, but, but tell us about Kevin's journey with COVID. Yeah. I mean, it was, it was fast. He said he had a sore throat and he asked if he could come over and, you know, sore throats, like not, not anything crazy. So I was like, fine, come over and see, see my daughter. And she was a, a baby still. And, um, a week later he was, on his on his bed coughing his lungs out and and having trouble breathing and um i broke into to his his room and he looked very ill and i called the ambulance they came they picked him up and um that was the you know last time i saw him before he left the hospital and i got a phone call from him um and the doctors a couple weeks later and they're like hey we got to put him on the ventilator otherwise he's done but usually when you're put on the ventilator, you're basically done at that point anyways. Like the recovery rate and survival rate of a ventilator is slim to none. So um, yeah, we ended up having a miracle at the end, but those th that month period where I was going to all hands um, with the company, I was going on sales calls, I was going on engineering meetings. It was just, it was hard to keep it together, to be honest. And even during all hands, I mean, People working at the company will tell you, like, I teared up many times because people are asking me, hey, how's Kevin? And you don't really have a good response other than, like, hey, co-founders not doing well. And uh, what are you going to do? You kind of have to look your team in the eye and balance, like, the utmost confidence that everything that we're doing is still going to go well. And then the other part is, like, trying to just be human. And at the end of the day, I am human. So I'm not going to front on, like, I'm feeling so happy when I just got off a call and nothing's changed with his status. I mean, for, forget the, you know, the business part of it, your co founder I mean, this is your brother. Your brother is going to die. Like, yeah. how, how do you, how did you ever consider stepping aside from the business? Like, how, how do you cope in the day? How do you keep focused in, in running the business during that time? Yeah, you, you just do it. When you have so many people who have committed their careers and lives to the company, um, I know that's what Kevin would have wanted, is that you have to be just rock solid during this time period and be the rock for everyone. Like the impact that I was feeling, you know, 50 other people were also feeling it at the time. And you, 
you really just have to be strong for everybody. It sucks because I had to be strong for my family. I had to be strong for the company. And you don't really have time to be thinking about yourself. And, and I was, I was tired. I was exhausted. And you know, when you are CEO of a company and you have so many people's lives and, and people who have committed their careers to, to catalyst, um, you know, Kevin, I knew he would want me to be strong for, for the people uh, at this company. And it's, it was, it was tough, like trying to keep a straight face, trying to push on, trying to do the best of my abilities to help close deals, run marketing campaigns, figuring out what we're going to do on engineering. And it was a very, very stressful time period. I also have a, a newborn baby at the time and, and uh, you're kind of locked in a small apartment where with nowhere to go. I would say the total s- amount of stress level is at like 300% and you just got to do it. There's no, nothing, no choice that you can, you can have other than just being there for everyone. And I think at the end of the day, that's what the CEO's job for. That's what you sign up for. That is why it's the hardest job. Everyone's problem is your problem and you are the leader and you have to, you have to act like it. Even when you are yourself running out of energy, you are yourself running out of faith. You are crying every single night, but at the end of the day, you just, you can't show all of that. Cause at that point in time, the company would have crumbled if I stepped aside. And by the way, you're missing your COO, presumably your right-hand man and your co-founder. So there's, there's that too. Yeah. And like I said, he, he would have wanted me to keep, keep going as well. And, and, you know, we, this was our dream to launch a company together. I wanted to be as optimistic. I always just thought to myself, he's going to get better. He's going to get better no matter what. Um, and you just have to have blind faith. And in order to keep the company going, you have to balance that. Right. And, um, yeah, an option was I could have stepped aside, but then with both me and my co-founder out, that's basically the company, you know? So we were also in a very pivotal time. We had just raised a massive round from Spark at the time, literally the same month as him being on the ventilator. So there's a lot of expectations that are just crushing and you, I, I just had to do it. So was this, he was on the same, in the same month he was on the ventilator, you had just finished closing your round. I, I mean, what was like, what was the overlap in time here? Was it, are we talking about like a matter of, of a couple of days here or there, and you may not have raised that round? Exactly. Yeah. It was literally the same, same time period. It was, it was nuts. Um, money in the bank, boom, ventilator, just like that. Wow. That's actually not the part of the story I want to focus on, you know, is kind of the bottom of that abyss. And, and I'm, I'm so glad that, that he's rebounded and everything is, is okay. Um, and worked out the way that it did. I, I'd like for you to share how you, how he got from that low point being on the ventilator, not knowing whether he was going to live or not to ultimately being able to walk out of that hospital or likely he was rolled out on a wheelchair, but being able to get out of that hospital. Um, what did you do to help in your brother's recuperation from COVID? Yeah. Um, well, first of all, we bought masks for the hospital. We bought pizza for the hospital just so I could have access to the doctors. That was, that was kind of a strategic move that you just kind of have to do because the doctors at some point are going to get sick of me calling. I knew I was going to call every day. Uh, I did call every single day and I created a log. I still have this log on my iPhone notepad, which is I'm asking about his oxygen level. I'm asking about his, his, um, breathing level. I'm asking about his, his nutrition. Like what, what are they feeding him? I'm asking about, um, so many things that at one point in time, they thought I was another doctor from another hospital calling. Uh, they were like getting confused on, on who this person was that was calling every day. And you have different rotational nurses that are just like expecting. And I got the jargon down so well because I'm calling about the same thing every single day. And uh, we also got tr- one of my employees in, uh, at the company. We got the treatment plan from China and we sent it to the doctors. And the doctors here were like, oh my God, how did you get this? Because at that point in time, China was a month or two ahead of us here. So a lot of the things, treatment plans, they've already tried that out. So um, it was a daily process. It was like, go to my meetings, 
go to sales calls, handle all hands, work on decks, investor updates, call to hospital. Repetitive was, every motion every single day. I mean, I think what I'm hearing from the story is that what saved your brother's life was the treatment plan from the procurement team, procurement team at Catalyst, effectively. You, you basically repositioned your, your team to pr procure, like, you know, the secret formula to, to save your brother's I, life. I don't know if that saved them, but it validated what the U.S. doctors were planning to do. I think they probably looked at that plan and they're like, oh, great, we're already, this is the next wave of ideas that we have. Here's what they're doing that work. Here's what they're doing. I, I don't think they read that doc was like, okay, whatever the, the Chinese government is giving, let's get, let's give it play by play. But they absolutely thought it was helpful. And I think for us, like, I think the, the point of that was like, it was whatever it takes, whatever it took to get him back in order. Like I wasn't just sitting around waiting for the doctor. She's just telling me, Hey, we got a plan on this. Like as an entrepreneur, you take things into your own hands and, and you're trying to control the story and you're trying to control the, the outcome and, and you are procuring whatever necessary to, 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 to save them at that point. And that's actually why I wanted to talk about the story because when I first heard it from you, we were at dinner and what struck out, what stuck out immediately to me were, were all the entrepreneurial, entrepreneurial elements within you, all the characteristics of an entrepreneur, the grit, the hustle, the perseverance, you know, never, never uh, succumb to, to people saying no, uh, the resourcefulness, ultimately that really helped, you know, save your brother's life. So kudos to you. I think it's just a reminder to all of us that entrepreneurship can come in very different forms. It doesn't always have to take place in an office setting. Yeah. I think being an entrepreneur is just not giving up even when you're feeling at your lowest, lowest point and you got no way on. I think you actually gain more entrepreneurial skill sets when you're pinned against the wall and you're cornered and you got no chance. And at this point, this is as cornered as you can get. I mean, a brand new virus that nobody in the world has heard of and, and your brother and co-founder is dying from it. And you, you got to do what you got to do. You were not sure if it's going to work, but you sure as hell were going to go down swinging and throwing and see whatever, it, whatever sticks. And, and um, yeah, something worked. All right. I'm not going to let us end this episode on COVID. So, so Edward, to close us out. I, here, I hope not. No, no. What, what are you most excited about? You, your, your company is helping to create so much energy in the CS space along with others. What are you most excited about the trends that you're seeing within this, you know, a little bit of a doom and gloom period right now and, and a lot of uncertainty. What's some of the silver lining that you're seeing? I think the silver lining is, and it's not even silver lining, it's just factual at this point, is that the CS community, CS leaders and CSMs have the seat at the table. Whether they want to or not, they are now at the head of the table driving the most important mission. The only thing that can truly move the needle because sales is outside of everybody's control. Like nobody knows where the market is going. Uh, nobody knows how the economy is going to continue to trend. What you have control over is your customers, your customers adoption, um, and still maintaining those champions. And actually in order to sell, you're going to need more champions. You're going to need people, more people advocating for you. So customer marketing, if anything, is the most important thing right now. And those come from the relationships and the programs that CS are building. So to me, like, this is really great for everybody in customer success. This is really great for CSMs who want to move up in their career. This is really great for people that want to go into leadership roles because whether you like it or not, you are involved in the most important initiative for the company and you are in those leadership discussions and you are responsible for those initiatives that are being driven top down by the board to the CEO and to the rest of the execs, which is creating the best possible experience to keep as many customers as possible and extract as much revenue from, from the existing customer base. Edward Chu, a beacon of customer success, a beacon of entrepreneurship. Thank you so much for being on. Yeah. Turned. There is, there are some dark spots throughout this, this, this recording, but uh, let's, I'm glad we ended on, on a bright beacon note. So, so thank you for that. But, that, that was a roller coaster ride and, and that was that was fun. I appreciate it, Josh. Awesome.